you have to get your piece of work through before it can actually even be put out there. Yep. And, uh, and that includes blogging and tweeting. <coughs> yes. So you're actually not allowed to do that. Yes. You no, that, 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 and, and there are, you know, I know of a number of laboratories, I know a number yep. of research schools that funding your do, do the same thing as well. As well. Yeah. Um, what, in those situations, yes, you've got to take that all on board. But it's still no reason why you can't approach your school, your government department, and say, look, I really would like to start doing this. What can I do within running a Twitter stream about this kind of stuff? That's a, that's a discussion you need to have with the people that are holding the, 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 the strings around the media engagement for your particular institution uh, or department. Yeah. But, that, that, but the, the, the first step is for you to have the desire to actually do something in, with respect to communication and then take that to them and say, look, this is what I'd like to do. What can we do in the space? Okay, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this, uh, I don't mean to be, uh, what, I'll be candid. Yep. This, um, I found the best way to do this was backdoor. In other words, to get other people to actually ask. You know, let's talk to other people who can then approach yep. management to say, where's this information? Yeah. And that, that, that way things get put out. Yeah. Um, if you, 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 you almost cannot sell a case from the bottom up. Yeah. Um, uh, particularly in that top bureaucratic structure. The other one is um, uh, when scientific information is produced by the government or any research organisation, and it is held or considered secret, even though it might be publicly funded and really stuff you, you pull off the yeah. next, you know. Uh, that one's always been a major issue because you actually have to argue a case for that, actually not referencing anything that's not allowed to be talked about. Yeah, no, 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 no. You're misunderstanding communicating with the public. Well, with, well no, with, no, with, no, with, I'm talking with, about you're, communicating you're, across the board. Yeah, but you're, you're confusing telling the world about what you're doing with making a contribution as a scientific or engineering communication to the pro professional organisation. You know, what you tell the world is not a peer-reviewed piece no. of information. It's, it's basically a record of what you're up to, how you're feeling. Stuff that will never make it into a peer-reviewed mm -hmm. journal. So, uh, you, you do need to be quite clear on that. And, and in fact, uh, particularly within the sciences, uh, you may need to make sure that you're not going to reveal anything in your popular communications that will jeopardise a peer-reviewed pu uh, publication. That's right. You know, and, and, and that, that's, a, that's just something that you have to manage. Um, but I know of a couple of cases who've, uh, that, that are in exactly the same situation. Uh, of you know, they're, they're in, uh, they were both in. Um, schools that uh, wanted to control of it, and they were quite happy to, you know, take the ball by the horn and say, "Well, buddy, you, you know, you can't tell me what I, on my own personal Twitter stream, tell the world." And so they've just gone out and that uh, uh, the, the, both of them developed their Twitter streams uh, into blogs, and they'll tell the world what it is that they're up to in a private capacity. I think you'll find. Sure. But not on your work, and you're not to represent your work. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about two cases that are, uh, these two cases were within universities, yes. not government departments. Um, and in both cases, eventually down the track, when you know the, the, uh, the, the school said, hang on, hang on, what are you doing talking about your research? We said you can't do that. They were able to actually turn around and say, yeah, but you do realise that <laughs> I was able to include some of those blogs as outreach that uh, got me my ARC grants. Yeah, I'm not asking so, you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, just that there is, um, yeah, slightly, yeah. I'm just, I'm, 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 you know, certainly within the university mm -hmm. setting, there is a, a, I can name a couple of precedents where just bulldozing ahead and doing it off your own back um, actually paid dividends. Um, but 
you're dead right, you know, particularly in the government set, uh, situation where they do like to try and control their information. Um, you need to be cognizant of that. It disturbs me. Surely you can still talk to the world uh, uh, about what you're up to. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of how much information you give and how you attribute it. I don't know. That's something that you would need to work through uh, yourself with your department. Sometimes, I mean, it just involves getting in touch with the right people. If yeah. You're actually engaged in that type of research already. Yeah. And you often want peer reviewed research to back you up. Yeah. And so you require people to sign up or approve that. Yeah. You know, um, so it, it's. But once again, I've even been in situations I've asked people for, you know, for them to uh, um, to support something I'm doing without actually being able to tell them fully what I'm doing. Yeah. Which is a bit weird. But, you know, I mean, particularly uh, in university settings where um, uh, you've got cases of uh, citizen science projects. I mean, how on earth can you run a citizen science project without a decent book feed? Mm. Uh, without good communications with the general public that have to be pretty rapid. You can't, you know, um, just uh, run everything through the media unit because that's just doesn't work. And so this channel of communication direct from the researchers to the public has developed. Um, the media units kind of keep an eye on it and uh, you know, make sure you don't go outside the bounds and uh, get the university in any trouble. But otherwise, look, it's all good communication. And chances are the university media unit is going to take credit for it anyway. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you know, uh, <coughs> you, you you have to be cognizant of these these factors, and you have to uh, play uh, carefully around them. But yeah, uh, I, I would strongly advise that, 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 that uh, as daunting as that prospect might be, don't let it put you off trying to develop uh, a a stream of communication. Okay, so uh, any other questions before you all hit that task for 10 minutes? Have uh, any of you already done it whilst I've been driving? Yeah, no. <laughs> you, 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 you can't you get back and sort it out. Can I just ask who funds Australia's Science Channel? You said you we have core funding uh, from the South Australian Government, the Federal Government, and from Sandos. And uh, the way that we are structured for our revenue uh, to actually keep us going uh, is through sponsorships of a huge number of corporations, universities, museums, uh, and some philanthropists. So uh, the, the, we've, we've set up Australia's Science Channel so that um, there are lots of sponsorship opportunities. And it's through sponsorship. We, we don't want to have advertising on the Science Channel. We think that would turn off our uh, intended audience. So, okay. So, ten minutes. Tell me what you want to say, who you want to say it to, and why you want to say it. And I'll see if I can do battle with this. <laughs>
is for every researcher. The other thing is, uh, another curse of the modern age with the uh, mobile phone uh, is that you never leave the office. And so I actually spent that break in the corner answering emails, and I've just found out I've been made an adjunct professor at Flinders University. Oh. <laughs> I'm actually working my way up to an adjunct Nobel laureate, but <laughs> that's another story. Anyway. So, let's, shall I go through and pick people at random, or do we have volunteers who would like to, to <coughs> tell me what they're doing, who they want to talk to, and why they want to talk to them? Do we have any volunteers, or do I have to select volunteers? Aha! 
<laughs> uh, and I can be the sucker for the, yes. for the start of it. Yes. Uh, so this is from our research uh, that we have been doing quite recently, and it's about chlamydia, and it's quite gratifying to work with because I have quite a nice about chlamydia. Well, it deserves a clap anyway. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, oh, um, so, like everybody knows it as a sexual disease because it's really common. But what people forget is that it used to be really common in the eyes as well as trachoma, and we had, with our living standards, it's sort of been eradicated. But in poor countries like Africa, and also within the indigenous population here, it's still common. So what we are working with is that we're looking at the genomics of this. And people thought that, at least in 2012, that uh, for years now we've known that you have the ocular strains and you have sexual strains. And that was it's millions of years apart before after they split. And um, we looked at some uh, trachoma strains here in Australia, and it turned out that, as with a lot of other things, like the kangaroos, French mammals, trachoma in Australia is different. There are actually sexual strains that have very, very small parts in common with the uh, ocular strains that you find elsewhere in the world. So that then just showed that the whole evolutionary tree that they had and thought was the gospel, wasn't true. So something had happened. So that's, out of an evolutionary perspective, interesting. But that's just science. Yep. Um, and what we were thinking more is that we need to communicate this to the people that are doing the trachoma eradication to say that things are not as simple as you are thinking. But basically, if you have a lot of sexual disease, which you have everywhere, and you eradicate the ocular disease, but you still have a lot of sexual disease, these might convert and start causing ocular disease again, unless you actually improve the living standards in general. So concentrate on the living standards. Okay, so fascinating story. I never realised track was so complicated. Um, who's your primary audience? Who do you, um, want, to, who do you want to talk to? Uh, I think this wouldn't be of general interest so much. It would be mostly for the people that are doing the trachoma eradication, so the sort of public health people, and other scientists that are working with defining their anatomical niches and saying that, well, you know what, you had all these genes along this little evolutionary branch that you thought could be connected, but it's actually fewer. But, uh, Is it a problem in Australia or in any communities within Australia? In most indigenous communities, though. Okay. Then, having answered who you want to talk to and why, that shapes <coughs> how you're going to do it, what format or what platform you're going to choose. What springs to your mind? What do you think would be the most effective way of reaching public health? I think there would be uh, an educated general public interest, um, but also uh, the, those communities where this is actually a problem would be part of the audience. So how would you reach that pretty mixed audience? Uh, what we did was that we went down that ancient pathway mm -hmm. with the press release, and it ended up being picked up by multiple uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, a UK newspaper said that STIs can make you blind. So we were completely misunderstood there, <laughs> even though they had the, the press release. Yeah. And um, so I'm not really sure what, okay. what, what way, aside from scientific publications, but that relies on people actually seeing it, noticing it. Okay. Well, you say you went out uh, with a press release. Do you know if that went through the Australian Science Media Centre, the OSSMC? <coughs> With, they're, they're actually housed in the same building as us in Adelaide. Uh, their specialist job is connecting researchers to the media and media to researchers. So they've got three and a half thousand specialists across every discipline on their books. And if a journalist phones up and says, I need an expert in chlamydia, bang they can give them all of Australia's experts on chlamydia that are on their register. Mm. 
I strongly advise that uh, you get in contact with the AusSMC, let them know your areas of expertise and go on that register, and also uh, ensure that any future uh, media releases go through them. Because what they do is uh, every week they put out uh, a list of stories that are coming up uh, for publication that week with all the background material and the embargo date so journalists can log in, put the story together and hold it until the embargo is lifted and bang, they're out of the story first. <coughs> And that's distributed not only across Australia, but around the world, because there's nine uh, science media centres now, and they're all interlinked, and they all swap stories between each other. So uh, that's a really, for, for that kind of research that has um, an old media appeal, uh, I strongly recommend contacting uh, the OSSMC uh, and uh, their, their website is called Cymex, S-C-I-M-E-X, um, and you're getting, getting familiar with them. That's, that's one way to, to really boost getting your message out. Uh, getting a message out to indigenous communities is um, a difficult challenge. We, we do that through uh, community feedback on the yeah. Arts. yeah, that that is a very specialist um, audience to get to. They, don't tend to be as online savvy as everybody else, but they do have community structures uh, where knowledge is passed around. And so if you can work out ways of telling your stories so that they get into those community structures, and, uh, and that, that's probably the best way in there. But I, I've not actually had to, to deal with um, trying to get a message across to indigenous communities in that way. Um, but something springs to mind uh, with respect to health professionals is, uh, uh, and, 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 and the, the more educated lay public, uh, is the conversation. Uh, they are always calling out for specialist, detailed, interesting pieces. And uh, if you were to write for them, that would be picked up. The, the, they have a dedicated uh, health channel um, uh, in the conversation website. Uh, and that would be a really good way to get that message out to that audience. Uh, Australia's Science Channel is also uh, <laughs> developing a health channel. And if you were to make, uh, if you were to write a blog, uh, if you were to make a video, uh, we would be only too happy to, to put that story out on Australia's Science Channel. So, see me. Okay. okay, the water has broken, the, the seal has been broken, ladies and gentlemen. We've had one land of the slaughter now, who's next? Come on, come on. Or am I going to volunteer someone? Okay, up the back, yes. Agriculture in general? Uh, 29 specifically plant history, so horticulture. Um, so we, we do have a YouTube channel and we do basically how to grow things. Um, so it's specifically targeting a lot of growers who don't have any ag education, um, looking at new technologies, so turning over a lot of stuff in nitrogen. Looking at things that are difficult to understand, such as greenhouse gas emissions in the soil, um, and then we also have a small research component on what, what we're doing. Okay. Um, something that, uh, you know, the, the, the thing there, it, it, it's quite generalist uh, overall. 
but rather than a specialist line of research. Yes. And the information that you want to get across, when you talk about things like greenhouse gases and soils, yes. there's already a lot out there um, uh, on, on the net in particular uh, about the, what, what's actually going on there. And uh, it's not all Malcolm Roberts, it's uh, some of it's really good stuff, it's uh, decent uh, material. And I would think that uh, your first uh, your opening gambit would actually be why don't you bring those existing pots of information together so you, you, don't, you don't necessarily need up front to create anything new. Mm -hmm. But if, if they are, are, are all brought together in an area on the department website or somewhere like that, so that scientists, uh, so that farmers who are your primary audience, yeah. they can access that information that you have gone through and vetted, so you've weeded out the, yeah. the, the yeah. cranks. Yeah, um, that would be how I would approach taking that body of knowledge directly out there. And then, you know, if, if you have a specific research project, then you need to look at it in a different way. Uh, that's when you start thinking about tweeting and what have you. But that building of that knowledge base in an archive somewhere, um, that can actually generate its own Twitter account. Mm -hmm. So that you build an audience of people who are coming in there, they all follow you on Twitter, and every time a new piece of information goes in there, out goes a tweet to all of those farmers, so they all know to have a look and catch up on the latest thing. And that way you, you build up that body of knowledge that way to service that particular industry. Yeah, I understand completely. We are actually we um, because we're in the government, we put in a request to have a Twitter account eight months ago. Yeah. And we're still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and, and you know, Twitter in particular is an invaluable way of being able to draw attention to um, your, your primary communications. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a, a Twitter and a Facebook account uh, off of Australia Science Channel, and really all that does is just drive the audience back to the site to see the latest video or to read the latest blog that we put up. Um, but you can also, uh, with the Twitter stream uh, used that way, you also uh, create an online community with similar interests. And so it doesn't all have to be, you know, here's the next factual piece of information. It can be, uh, we're, we're having a field day, uh, you know, and, and our staff will be in, I mean, Catherine on a field day or something like that, you know, it's almost a, a social calendar. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can link all those sorts of things. That would be of interest to your community that you're building online. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's how I think it uh, would best handle that kind of body of information. Yeah, no, that sounds hopefully will happen. Yeah, uh, you, you can also bring in um, Snapchat and Instagram. Um, probably can't bring in Tinder, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> good luck trying. <laughs> Swipe right for science, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, who's next?
it is a little bit harder. Like I, I really admire the idea of going out with a camera and mm. on my phone and, and taking videos, but I, I think um, the time that I would need to do that is greater because I would never, I wouldn't do that without the involvement and engagement of the people that I work with. And I think that one of the things that we do struggle with a little bit because of time is about getting local people's voices into these sorts of and, media. And uh, if you're uh, working with remote Indigenous communities, chances are their internet connection is pretty poor, if it, if it exists at all. Yeah. So they won't want to be sitting down there trying to download a video to watch. Even though in an environment where you have an indigenous community that does have good internet connection, videos are really useful because they will watch a video if they won't read the blog. Yeah. So Yeah, um, so I guess there's like different ways and and it's something that I'm aware of and I think that we all try and manage. It just means that there's more communicate you know, levels of communication that on a community level you might put out a newsletter and and make a video that you show while you're sitting there with people. Uh, but you know, then you send, then you like the point of it is about creating um, better understanding from funding bodies who give the money to land and sea managers that they need to fund all parts of and you know that's kind of not just the environment. And so there has to be communication up to policy makers and government and yeah. NGOs and all of that, which is not the same as newsletter but but it's I, I guess my my interest is that I, don't, I see myself as a person in the middle you know, and it's not I, yeah. I find it difficult to find to get the uh, authority to tell that story yeah and I think the, 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 the question around authority, uh, I, I'm afraid I'd have to put back on you because mm. that, that is, as, as we were discussing earlier, that's going to uh, differ from uh, school to school, department to department, every institution is going to be different as to what authority is appropriate in that particular setting. Um, but here's an idea. When I visited remote indigenous communities, there's, although internet connection is poor or non-existent, there's usually a reasonable computer knocking around in the community. So why not distribute videos via thumb drives? Mm. So you can make a video of what you're up to, the message that you want to get out to those communities, and if you're going through the communities, just burn off copies onto a thumb drive. And, you know, you can get a deep thumb drive now for two dollars. It's ridiculous, mm -hmm. and that way you can spread those videos through those communities. That might be. Mm. Uh, it's a very specialist case. Mm. You know, uh, uh, another um, thing that probably doesn't apply to remote indigenous communities. Uh, is that when you're talking about rural engagement, um, probably the best tool is still ABC regional radio. Mm. The ABC regional radio networks are pretty comprehensive. They're always hungry for content. So if you are, pretty, you know, if, if the area that you're working in is covered by, no, no, <laughs> if I can, I'll yeah. continue the story yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, it, it, this may be of use to some others. If your area where you're doing your research, if the, if the audience that you want to reach, uh, contact are covered by uh, a particular regional um, station of the ABC, then you should approach them directly, that particular region, and say, I'm going to be in town on Thursday, I want to have a chat about blah. And chances are they will jump, jump at it because they are starved for content. And um, in regional areas, the ABC <coughs> is still seen as the most reliable way of, of distributing local knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, don't forget the, the, uh, the regional ABC. They, they have saved the ABC so many times 
from uh, complete annihilation. Because uh, certainly while I was there, there were two occasions where the government of a particular ilk, um, I won't say left wing or right wing, but I think you'll probably guess, um, uh, they wanted to kill the ABC. And they knew that they couldn't do it directly because there would be a backlash. And so they just kept cutting funding, cutting funding, <coughs> cutting funding. And uh, the way that that was stopped was because the coalition partners, how's that for a giveaway? <laughs> um, uh, when the cuts started to affect regional ABC, the coalition came in, uh, partners came and said, you've got to stop this. You've got to keep the ABC alive because all of our constituents rely on regional ABC for their information and news. So uh, it's, a, it's a really useful and powerful network uh, if you can tap into it. If it doesn't cover your area, I think you're back to thumb drives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, it, yeah, and I guess from my experience, I'm, I'm just a PhD student doing working in two different communities. Um, you have to be really adaptable by place. So I work in the APY and yeah. they aren't covered. Or I, I don't know, it's the first time I listen to regional APY. Uh, yeah. APT. Yeah. But they have PY media and that's got a radio station. So okay. that's, there's, a, there's a resource there. But then I also work in Nooka. So APY uh, APY has no phone reception really and limited internet. Nooka has strong phone reception, yeah. Telstra reception, but no radio and no. What, what sort of 